All right, why don't we stand for a moment as I get into the word this morning. I'll keep it brief, to the point. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to hear your word, God. We thank you that it, it is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it will bring transformation and change in our lives as we apply it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. And so this week here, I want to talk about um, a couple things. I want to talk about serving all. Serving all. And serving is a big topic, and, it, and, and we live in a society where serving isn't like the top of people's priority, um, but it is part of the kingdom culture. And, um, you know, this week I, was, I met with Peter, and we were just talking, um, we were talking about church values. We're talking about the values of our church, All right? How many know values are important? Values are really important. And so there are some churches, there's some people, there's some families, there's some organizations that are program driven. They're driven by programs or they're driven by personalities. They're driven by leadership. And there's different ways to lead an organization. There's different ways to lead your family. But I want to say this, that um, um, programs can fail. Leaders can fail. Personalities can fail. But churches, organizations, families that are built around values will stand the test of time. When, when you build a ministry... I'm talking about ministry, but also your family, around a set of values. That's what holds, it's like the glue that holds you together. Amen? And, and we don't want a church here that's built around Pastor Travis and his preaching, or, you know, Don and Bianca's worship, or we don't want it to be built around, you know, a good kids program. Uh, we, we want it to be built around values that we all cherish and say, this is who we are, this is how we do things at the crossroads, amen? This is what heaven looks like. These are our values. And, and, and we want to build a church that whether I'm around or whether Pastor Peter's around or the worship team, uh, 10 years from now, we have all the little kids up here leading instead. Like, who knows, right? Uh, that, that it's built around values, not around people, okay? And um, I just want to take a few minutes to, to just list some of our values. And we're working on the, 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 the wording of them. But here's the first one, is relational discipleship. As a church, we believe very, very importantly uh, in, in relational discipleship. That means that Jesus took 12 men and he allowed them to walk with him through life and he led by example. He said, this is how you do life. And he led by example. His relationship with the crowd was different than his relationship with his 12 disciples. And that's why we do connect groups. We do small groups at this church because we believe that this message here on Sunday is, is being, information is put out and you're gathering that information. But when you go to small group, you're connecting with people and saying, how can we process God's word in our lives? What does that look like? How can we do life together? How can we reach the community? And so the word then becomes applicable and becomes personal and transformational. Does that make sense? And so we believe very importantly, as, as we're moving on as a church, we want to continue to be, become and be more relational in our discipleship. Number two is we believe in excellence. When I say the word excellence, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about giving God our best. Not giving God second best, but giving him our heart fully, okay? Number three, which I'm going to be talking about today, is servant leadership. We believe very important that God has called us to serve his people, amen? And we're leaders who serve other leaders. We serve people. And I don't like the word volunteer, because the word volunteer means you're doing good deeds, you're doing good works. But the word leader means you're changing the world. And I don't think there's volunteers in the kingdom because you're storing up treasures in heaven. Everything you do, it's not that you're just helping out and doing good things. You are literally establishing the kingdom of God. You're a leader in the kingdom and you will have fruit because of it. Amen? You are bringing change in the world. The next one is uh, we are presence-driven. We have presence-driven worship. Okay? Uh, we believe that when we worship here, our goal is that the presence of God will come. We're not just singing a few hymns. We expect God to come and move in the supernatural realm to be stirred up because we're worshiping our God. Very important to us as a church. Number five, uh, we believe in extraordinary, extraordinary generosity. We believe that we get to be a church that gives, and you know, if there's a, something in front of us, we're going to meet it. 
already this year, we are such a generous church. You guys are so generous. I mean, this year already, uh, I, I mentioned the New Life Girls Home needed a vehicle, and we took up a couple of offerings and bought them a really decent vehicle. Like, it was awesome. And, and then we had uh, the Anglican Church needed the down payment, and they had to close their building, but they didn't have enough money. So we said, hey, we'll bless you guys. We took up an offering and paid their down payment. Amen? Because we're, we're, we're a church that believes in extraordinary generosity. We want to give extravagantly, right? That's how we want to give. And the next one is uh, total healing. We believe in total healing, spirit, soul, and body. We, we don't just believe that, you know, Jesus died to forgive your sins, but also to heal your body. Amen? What did I forget? I did. Okay, character and honor. That's another one. And that's important, and they go together, right? Because we, we're people that we, we want to have character in our lives, and we want to honor other people, right? We don't want to make accusations. We want to sit down and talk to people, get to know them. We want to have character. We want to have honor. And we could spend a lot of time on these values. But one of the ones I want to focus on today is servant leadership, okay? Servant leadership. And so I want to say this. Relationships are birthed and maintained around common values, okay? Someone in the front row is going to get my halls in a second. <laughs> Relationships are birthed and maintained around common values, okay? Say that with me. Relationships are birthed and maintained around common values. I'll give you an example of that. Um, if you're into sports, if you like hockey, chances are you're going to end up hanging out with people who like hockey, and you're going to have something in common. You're going to be able to talk about who's, who's the next upcoming player and, and you know, what teams are playing and who's who. Right? I, ha I, I'm, I have no interest in hockey. I like to watch you know, the Stanley Cup playoffs. That's it. You know, I can't watch hockey, but some people do. And you know what? There's, there's a common bond. There's a common bond between people who, who maybe uh, are in business. They can, they can connect with people who are in business. They have something that they value that they can connect with. Some people, it's their faith. I can sit down and talk with someone who loves Jesus, and we can look at the time and go, where did the last five hours go? Why? Because we have a common value. We value the Lord, right? It can be hobbies. Uh, you, maybe you have a hobby. You like to knit. Well, you'll sit and knit with some old ladies right somewhere, just, and you love it. <laughs> or young ladies, amen. <laughs> Foot in mouth, right? I do that sometimes. Yeah. So, so, I mean, the, the hobbies, faith, business, sports, there's certain things we value, and because we value them, we connect with other people, and relationships are birthed and maintained around those values. And so, one of our values is servant leadership, all right? And um, we, we become united around our values, okay? And there's a difference between unity and uniformity, Okay? There's a big difference, and sometimes people don't quite understand what that is, but unity is, uh, is the state of being united or joined as a whole. It's basically you have the same values. So when a group of people get together and they have the same values and the same passions, there's a form of unity, right? Because you're joined as a whole. Say joined as a whole. Okay? And that's what we're trying to birth as a church. We want to be a group of people who are joined as a whole. We share common values, right? And the Bible says when you, when you have unity, God commands a blessing. Amen? Common values are very important. But the other word is uniformity. And the uniformity is a quality or state of being uniformed or conformity. So uniformity, to have uniformity, there has to be conformity. And sometimes we need to disagree to get along. And that's okay, right? And so, the, you know, I meet with pastors in the city, and we, don't, we, we have more uniformity than we have unity, okay? And that's not a bad thing, because we get together, all right, and we agree on the major doctrines. We agree on, on the, 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 the death, the burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We believe that the Spirit of God lives in us, and, and, and God, Jesus, is the way to the Father. So we agree on major doctrines. Say major doctrine. Major doctrine. But we don't agree on the minor doctrines, which um, don't determine your salvation. They're just different belief systems based on our, how we interpret the book, okay? 
But we get together and there's a uniformity where we just say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm willing to, to conform a little bit for the sake that I have to love my brother and you need to love me and we got to get along, right? Now, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you have family members that you don't have unity with. And they come over at Easter and Christmas and you have uniformity, right? How many hear what I'm saying? There's some conformity, right? You got to get along. You have to agree to disagree, all right? Um, but we have to have values. And as a church, we have values. As a family, you should have a set of values. And whether you've ever written those values down and sat down and talked about them, you have them. And do you know how you know you have values? It's the thing you do the most. It tells you what you value. And so here's a question. What would others say you're always doing? Not, not what you say you're always doing, but what would others say you're always doing? That's what you value. You know, I was sitting, I was sitting in my, on my bed, and I got this thing, like, I work hard during the day, and then I come home, and I like, I'm, I'm the type of person, I like, to, I like information, so I'll watch, like, every documentary. I watch them all, and I listen to information. I watch the news from all different aspects, and I even like the conspiracy stuff. I listen to all of it, and I kind of bring it all in, and I try to figure it all out. I love information. Say information. I love it. And some people, they, 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 they value uh, time with their family. Other people value uh, watching Netflix. Some people value sports. We all have things we value. And if you'd ask me, what do you value? I'd say, I value Jesus. I value prayer. I value worship. But my little son walks in and goes, Dad, you're always on that iPad watching the news. And I was sitting there going, no, I don't want him to say that. I want my son to say, Dad, you're always praying. Dad, you're always doing this, you're doing that. And it kind of woke me up because what other people, if they were to peer into your life and say, you're always doing that, that's what you value, right? Is this okay? And so it was kind of a wake-up call for me. And um, I want to see others see me value the things of the kingdom. How many want that? Okay. And I want to look at a girl here, a girl named Tabitha in the Bible. And let's see what happens here with Tabitha. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. And there was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in the Greek is Dorcas. Now, I don't know. It's not a very nice name, Dorcas. I was called that a few times when I was younger. Um, <laughs> but she was always doing, say she was always, say she was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. This is what she valued. She valued serving people. She valued the poor. She valued doing good things. And I look at her and say, I want to be like Tabitha. In fact, I think she was so valuable. Right after this verse, she got sick and she dies. And they go and get Peter and say, you got to come and pray for this. And Peter raises Tabitha from the dead because she was valuable. I mean, you don't want to lose Tabitha. Tabitha comes back and continues to serve. And I want to be like Tabitha. All right? Um, Tabitha was always thinking of others, and she's a great example of what we want to be. But I want to look at two other people uh, and what they valued. Go to Mark chapter 10, verse 35 to 36. Two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Uh, and he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? Like, is that self-focused or what? And, and it, this is in Mark. If you actually read the account in Matthew, because it's like God's not a genie in a bottle. Do you know that? And it's actually interesting in, in the, the Gospel of Matthew, the same story. Jesus turned to them and said, what do you wish for? In other words, you're rubbing the genie bottle, right? And, and, and they had this self-focus. We want you to do whatever we ask. And this is what he said to them. Okay, and I'm just going to summarize what he said. He basically said to them, okay, or they said to him, they said, listen, Jesus, uh, we want to sit down, one of us on your right hand, and one of us on your left hand, when you return to glory in heaven, we want to be seated on thrones beside you. And, and Jesus turned to them and said, listen, guys, you need to understand something. There's a price to pay in order to have positions of authority. You're going to have to lay down your life for me. And I'm just summarizing. And he gave them what that would look like. And then he said, 
Number two, I don't choose the thrones you're going to sit on. That's up to the Father. All right? So this is what he tells them. And, and here's the thing. The world system, which they were part of, is a self-promoting system. You need to always self-promote yourself to get ahead. You have to be, take care of number one. Uh, and I googled self-promotion, and this is what I came up with. came right up here. How to master the delicate art of self-promotion. Okay? Uh, it is easy to feel like you're doing a lot more bragging than self-promoting. Here's how to understand the difference. Okay, here's another one. This is by Forbes magazine. 40 ways to self-promote without being a jerk. All right? Here's another one. How to master the delicate art of self-promotion. Okay? Um, there's all kinds, and it was like pages and pages and pages of, of, of links you can go to to learn how to self-promote yourself, how to move ahead in life, how to move ahead. There was a survey done. My wife and I were watching a documentary, sorry. Um, <clears throat> just a, a clip about, they did this survey and they went to teenagers today and they said, what do you aspire to do? What, what, do you, what is important to you as a person? And this is what they said. Uh, the kids, majority of them said that they wanted to be a celebrity, a YouTube celebrity. And, and here's the thing. If you ask that question 20 years ago, you know what teens were saying? They would say, I want to be accepted in a community. I want to be part of a team. I want to fit in. I want to be part of a community. I want to be part of a team. I want to fit in. But today they're saying, I want to be noticed. That's what, that's what our culture feeds us, right? It's all about self-promotion. And so I want to be noticed, which makes us a goat. You know what a goat means? A goat means, I wrote it down here, the greatest of all time. I am a goat. I'm the greatest of all time. And your focus is on yourself. It's not on other people. All right? Say, are you a sheep or a goat? Which one are you guys here? Right? I'm a sheep, right? I'm not a goat. I'm not the greatest of all time. And that's what goats, goats have that attitude that they're all that, right? And so Mark chapter 10, verse 41, I want to show you how the other 10 disciples responded uh, to James and John. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be greatly displeased. Now, I want you to focus on the word greatly. Okay? They were ticked off with James and John. They were probably thinking, they beat us to it. They got to Jesus and they said, Jesus, you know, listen, we want to have them. And they're, now they're angry. They're ticked off. Like, man, I wanted that throne. I walked on water, you know. I'm, I'm Jesus' favorite. And then John is saying, no, I'm Jesus' favorite. Don't you read? I, read? I talk about myself in the second person all the time saying, hey, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. So he loves me more. And they're arguing about who's the greatest. Uh, and who gets that place? And look what happens here. Um, Mark chapter 10, verse 42. Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, lord it over them. And their, their great ones exercise authority over them. That's how the world system is. You've got to rule over people. It's all about dog eat dog, right? It's all about the, the, uh, uh, the survival of the fittest. But look what Jesus says in verse 43. Yet it shall not be so among you. You're, you're not going to rule and over people and control people. It, say, to get, let's read that together. It shall not be so among you. Jesus doesn't tolerate that. And look what he says here. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be a slave of all. See, serving isn't something we do. Serving is who we are. Because Jesus is a servant. And so if Jesus lives in us, what, and, and, and we're living and we're led by the Spirit, we're going to begin to serve because that's what Jesus did. His Father was also a servant. Our Father, God the Father. God is a servant to his children. And I'll go as far to say this. God is also a servant to those who hate him. That's the heart of God. If you don't believe me, let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and 45. 
You've heard, you heard the law say that love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In the same way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. All right? For God the Father gives his sunlight both to the evil and the good. He says, here, I'm going to serve you up a little bit of sunlight for your selfish self. He serves those who hate him. I'm going to send rain on the just and on the unjust alike. And this is how we have to be. As servants of God, we've got to serve those who love us. We've got to serve those who tolerate us. And we've got to serve those who hate us. Because that's what Jesus is. He's a servant. All right? Um, I want to look at three people who served in different ways. The first, the first one I want to look at is Jesus. Because Jesus is our example. And he, he girded up a towel around himself and served his disciples. In the same time that all this conversation is going on about who's going to sit beside Jesus in heaven, Jesus begins to talk. In John chapter 13, verse 2 to 8, he says, It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, a son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Okay? Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything that he had and that he had come from God and returned to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, and then he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. Okay? And um, I want to say something. Number one, in those days, that was the lowest responsibility. The lowest servant would have to wash people's feet. All right? Because in those days, people, they would walk from place to place. Most people couldn't afford a donkey or a horse, so they would be walking behind on the, on the road from one place to the next. They had open sandals, okay? And those who could afford donkeys and horses, as you know, the, those vehicles had nasty exhaust fumes, okay? There was a lot of exhaust coming out of the animals, all right? And it would get stuck between the toes of those walking on those streets, and they would come into the home and... This, the servant who was like the newbie that had to do the worst job would come with a bucket of water and a towel, get down, and wash feces and dirt and grime off of the feet so they could walk in the home without contaminating the home. That was the lowest place. And Jesus took that lowest place. He got down and he began to wash the feet of his disciples. And Peter said, Lord, Lord, you can't do that. I won't let you wash my feet. And he said, hey, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part with me because I'm a servant and I'm expecting you to do what I've done. But here's the key. If we went back to read verse 3, it says that because Jesus knew he was from his father, he was able to wash their feet. Those who have confidence in their identity are able to serve others. Those of us who are confident in our identity in Christ are able to serve others. Jesus took that place. Verse 6, it says, When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever, ever wash my feet. And Jesus replied, Unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Jesus saw proud hearts and filthy feet that day. And what really stood out to me as I was reading this passage through last night was this, that one of the 12 disciples was Judas Iscariot. And Jesus, knowing that Judas was betraying him, got down and washed his feet. Are you able to serve people, to love people that you know are talking about you behind your back? Are you able to do that? the power of the Spirit of God, you can do it. Amen? God is calling us to serve like He serves, okay? I don't want to say this. People have walked through a lot of filth. People have, will come into this house and this church. Some people walk into your home and they have filthy feet. They've gone through life and they've been defiled by the world. They've been places they shouldn't have been. They've got feces between their toes, to, so to say. They've got crap in their life and they come. And are we willing to get down and with, with mercy and with love wash the filth so that they can walk purely in the house of God? 
That's what God is calling us to as a church, to love people enough to get down and serve them and wash them with God's mercy so they can be part of his family. Amen? I believe that God promotes servants. And I want to look at what uh, God said to Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, uh, Samuel is um, you know, dealing with Saul, and he thinks Saul is this great king because of his stature. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or his height. All right? For I have rejected him. The Lord does not see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And God is looking for people that value the idea of being a servant. David was a servant through and through, and he, was, he wasn't a self-promoter. If you, if you study the life of David, you see that he had opportunity after opportunity to himself to take Saul out and become the next king, but he didn't. He waited for God to do it because he wasn't willing to self-promote himself. He was waiting for God, all right? And I want to talk about how David started. How did David start? He started by serving. He brought somebody lunch. He was serving his father in the fields. He's taking care of the sheep, right? That was what he did. And, and his dad, Jesse, called him and said, hey, I need you to bring sandwiches to your brother, right? They're, they're, they're out in the army. I want you to bring them some lunch. And he says, okay, all right. So he, he's carrying the sandwiches to his brother. He's, he's going to serve his brothers and to find out how things are going. And in the midst of serving, in that place of serving, God called him into a destiny and made him a giant killer. If he wasn't serving, if he was a guy who wouldn't serve, God would never have been able to move him into his destiny. David also played some music. He, he, was, you know, he was called in by King Saul. He would just play music. Because somebody had said, hey, the Spirit of the Lord shows up when this guy plays his harp. So he showed up and he served Saul. And because he was a servant, God promoted him. There's another way... Uh, there was, here's another person. So we talked about Jesus, wrapped himself with a towel. Number two, we talked about David, who brought some lunch. And number three, we have uh, the Shunem woman uh, who made room for people. How many know we have to make room for people? And I just want to read this story about the woman from, woman from Shunem. One day, Elisha came to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there to get something to eat. Okay? And she said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Okay? Let's build a small room for him on, on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. And then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem, and when he went up to the upper room to rest, he said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak to her. And when she appeared, Elisha said, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you've showed us. What can we do for you? We can put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army. And I think that would be a pretty cool thing, because he was the he was the he was the celebrity prophet. I mean, he had audience with the king. He had audience with the, the, the leader of the army. And he could have put in a good word, and she could have received acclamation, right? Look what she says. No, she replied, my family takes good care of me. I'm not serving you, Elisha, to get something out of it. I'm serving you because my heart compels me to serve. This was the heart of this woman. And look what happens. Later, Elisha said to Gehazi, what can we do for her? So Gehazi re replied, she doesn't have a son, and her husband's an old man, and call her back. All right, and Elisha said, when the woman returned, Elisha said to her as she stood in the doorway, next year at this time, you'll be holding a son in your arms. And she said, no, my Lord. She said, don't lie to me, <laughs> right? Man of God, I, don't deceive me. Don't get my hopes up. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant, and the time the following year, she had a son. Isn't that amazing? Just as Elijah has said. I want to say this. God rewards the ones who serve others. If you're willing to serve others with no strings attached, I'm not doing it to get uh, people to recognize me. I'm not doing it to get anything out of it. I'm just serving because, not because it's what I do, but it's because it's who I am. We're servants of the Most High God. It's who we are. 
And so if you do that, if you have a heart to serve others, what happens is God will reward you openly. And you'll be going through life, and all of a sudden you'll be like, boom, like where did this blessing come from? It's because you're serving. No strings attached. And God blesses that. Our mission statement here at the church is that we're called to model Jesus and share his love. How did Jesus do life? We want to model what he did, and we want to share his love with others, right? Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. And one day, say one day, we will all stand before Jesus. And I, and I, I, want, to, I want to read what that's going to look like, and then we're going to close. So give me five minutes. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 and 32. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will, be, he will separate the people as shepherds separate the sheep from the goats, the greatest of all time. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 to 40 says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, uh, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world, for you had all your doctrine figured out perfectly. Oh, it doesn't say that. Sorry. Um, for I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then these righteous ones will say to the Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? This is something that's going to happen. There's going to be people standing before God sometime in the history of the future. They're going to say, God, when did we, we didn't see you. And he's going to say to them, he's going to say, And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it for the least of these, my brethren and sisters, you did it for me. You saw me hungry, you fed me. You saw me thirsty, you gave me something to drink. You saw me a stranger and you showed hospitality. You saw me naked, you gave me clothing. When did we ever see you sick? When did we ever see this? And Jesus said, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Some of you are going to stand before God one day and you say, Jesus, when did, I, when did I help? And Jesus is going to say, you know, when you sponsored a child through World Vision and you took care of that need, when you, know, when you went across the street, when you knew your neighbor was going through a tough divorce and they were depressed and you went and showed your love and you prayed for them, when you, know, when you worked with those girls and sacrificed your time at the New Life Girls Home and you poured yourself out, you were doing it as if you were doing it to me. Jesus stands there at the great judgment throne and he says, you serve me. And then he says something. He says something very powerful. He says, um, do you guys remember what he says? Well done, you good and faithful servant. Because serving isn't what we do. Serving is who we are. We're servants of the most high God. You know, God is doing an amazing thing. We talk about, you know, we were just talking about what's happening politically. But, you know, when, when the enemy moves in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises a standard. Isn't that good? And that's what's happening. Why don't we stand, and we're going to close in prayer. If you want to know if you're in the perfect will of God... Have a servant's heart and look for opportunities to serve, and you'll be in the center of his perfect will. Right? Say, God, I want to serve in the areas you've called me to serve, in the church, but also outside of the church, in my family. Father, I thank you, Lord, for every person in this place. Lord, I thank you that this message, it even speaks to my heart, that you've called us. We're a people. We don't serve because it's what we do. We serve because it's who we are. We're servants of the Most High God. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're speaking to every heart in this place, and you're speaking to us about 
ways that we can serve and, and be faithful in serving in new capacities, Lord. We want to honor you, and we're going to stand before you one day and say, Lord, when we saw you naked, we clothed you. When we saw you sick, we visited you. We took care of you. Father, I thank you that you're sealing this word by your spirit. And all God's people said, amen.